Am I too loud? Yeah. I can't hear me at all? Yeah. Hello. Okay. Yeah. All right. So welcome to the Healthcare Summit. We're really glad you're here. Thanks for sticking around. Thanks for coming if you went to the after after party. So we're excited to get going today. So first of all, um, this is the committee for the Healthcare Summit. I am Jeannie Cost. I am a project manager at Slalom. Hi, I'm Pooja. I'm Associate Product Marketing Manager at Digital Factory 24. And my name is Ben Nellinson. I'm a worker owner at the Agaric Technology Collective, which means I do the creative direction and strategic planning and dishwashing. And then are you going to, oh, you want me to introduce George? Okay, and then George cannot be here. George is Mathis. Um, he I couldn't. Guess. I guess George. Sorry. Okay, yeah, you were going to say. I thought it was, was going to be me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyhow. But yeah, and then our, our fourth host, um, George Mathis, unfortunately cannot be with us today. He's um, more than 20 years in web development, engineering management, and product management. He's been a digital agency owner, director of clinical solutions at Pfizer, and a consultant specializing in discovery and digital strategy. Okay. All right. So this is today's schedule, and I can't see it on there, but... So we're going to do, um, so we're doing the welcome and intro, and then we're going to have uh, introductions within your table here in just a minute. Then first up, we have Andy Waldrop. Then we're going to have a sponsor talk from phase two on behalf of Acquia. Then we'll have a break, and then we're going to have some table talks. So you'll mingle with your table, and we'll have different topics. The first one will be AI, which, you know, of course, has been a big topic here this week. And then we will have Jesse Meese and Georgiana Mosgras. And we'll have lunch. And then we have John Stewart. John, are you here? And then we'll have another table talk about, you know, what is your biggest takeaway from DrupalCon. And we'll have a break. And then we'll have another sponsor talk by Evolving Web. And then we will have some lightning talks at the end. So if you want to do one, like five minutes, um, come up and see Ben or myself and we can get you slotted in for the end of the day here. Um, any questions so far? Okay. All right, so we wanna let you get to know each other a little better. So I'm taking something that we do from the Seattle Drupal user group. We always have a uh, intro, you know, we say our name, what we do with Drupal, and then we have an icebreaker question. So today's icebreaker question will be, what brought you to the healthcare summit? So in your table, introduce yourself to each other, and then you know answer the little icebreaker question, and then we will uh, get going with Andy. Okay? So go ahead, talk <laughs> on yourselves.
Hello. All right, everyone. We're going to get started with our first speaker. So we have Andy Waldrop. He's going to be talking about building um, scalable healthcare content products with Drupal. Andy is the VP of Digital Experiences at WebMD Ignite. He leads the product and engineering teams focused on solutions that improve customer experiences across the patient journey. Andy has been an innovator in the digital marketing space for over 15 years with leadership experience, consulting with some of the largest health systems in the U.S. All right, Jesse, we'll turn it over to you. All right. I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> we do have Jesse, the, Jesse? the Honorable oh. Jesse Meese right Sorry. here. So, no, I'll take it. Thank you, Jeannie. I used to work with both of them. <laughs> well, that, that is the wonderful thing about this conference is we get to connect again with, with colleagues you haven't seen in a while. Maybe you've worked in the past. So, wonderful to be here. Um, just a little bit about me. Jeannie mentioned I work at WebMD Ignite. This was DrupalCon in Portland two years ago. Um, this is my daughter's favorite picture. Um, I don't know how many people have like reset their iPhones now that when you call you can have a photo pull up. This is what she's selected for me. So always an interesting thing with new business associates where like that that's my photo now when you call. Um, you know, so a few other things about me. Um, been a Drupal user for about 14 years. Um, I'm more on the design side of things, so I'm not a developer, but I've worked with Drupal and Drupal projects for, for that long. Um, I also love to randomly put googly eyes on things. Um, this is a new thing as of this year. Um, my dad had like a, a very large heart surgery in the beginning of this year. He was in the ICU for a, a month. Um, he's totally fine, but in that process, uh, my daughters had this little adventure book, and one of the, the games was, hey, go find googly eyes and go put them all over your house, and we did it at my parents' house, and it was this huge, huge hit. So now I carry around googly eyes on the flight later today. I'm sure I'll put some googly eyes in the back of the pamphlet. Um, I live in North Carolina. Every elevator in North Carolina has this guy's face, so like he gets tagged every place I go. Um, so anyway. Just a little bit about me. Um, so today, um, we're talking about content with WebMD. Wanted to start with what's the difference between these two logos. So WebMD on the left, that is what we all know. WebMD.com, massive consumer-facing health brand, mostly focused on information, right? So is this a rash or is it eczema, that kind of thing. Um, WebMD Ignite is the part of WebMD that works with healthcare providers. So we don't work with pharma, we don't work with non-care providers, but we have a variety of solutions um, for healthcare providers. And that could be traditional health systems, that could be Amazon or Walmart or other big players in the space too. Um, quick, quick history that we'll get into how are we now managing content, but on the left side, um, you know, WebMD's first acquisition was Medscape. I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with Medscape, but that is the largest doctor source of clinical information. Um, over 70% of all doctors use Medscape at least once a year. Most of them are using it daily, uh, depending on your specialty. But this is where you would go to research something and have really, really deep content there. Um, Vitals.com was a national doctor directory. Crames um, is a clinical content source. Um, 40 2% of all health systems in the U.S. use Crames content for their clinical content. So if you go see a doctor and your doctor is assigning you content, either in your EMR system or printing it out for you, it's most likely either Crames or HealthWise at, at the end here. Um, PulsePoint is a healthcare-specific DSP, more on the advertising side. Wellness Network is a TV video system in hospitals. So waiting rooms, patient rooms, playing content um, that's healthcare focused, like maternity ward might have like birth related content playing there. Mercury Healthcare is where I joined this company from. That was more CRM, uh, predictive model intelligence, and digital ad services, as well as websites, um, uh, digital experiences. And then just recently, two months ago, we bought HealthWise, 
which was Cream's largest competitor. So now we have over 72% of all health systems in the US use our content well for their clinical content. So not their website content, but when we're thinking about what content is actually being assigned to a patient from a doctor, whether it's videos or written content, um, it's most likely coming from, from one of these libraries. So this is a lot, right? This, uh, uh, our revenue in four years has grown 12x. Um, so it, it's been a rocket ship and there's a lot of stuff to do. So um, in Ignite, this is what we think about our business being. I'm only gonna focus on the two right sides today, patient education and digital experiences because that's kind of what's relevant for this audience and really dig into how we're trying to solve problems with Drupal and content and how we're doing it. We'll open up the hood a little bit too and show just like how we're building things in Drupal a bit. Um, I'll just go ahead and say now, invite anyone into the room when I'm demoing. If you have a question, we can just raise your hand. We'll do it. We'll do it in lifetime. Um, so the, the first challenge to solve, this is our new branding for what we think of as Crames and HealthWise, like those big education steps. If that's the phase where a user's in and we want to provide that clinically, medically reviewed education, um, you know, this is, uh, this is how we're thinking about those, those uh, content corpuses. Um, lots of numbers up here, lots of different types of content. Um, these assets um, have just recently come to fruition. So there's things that we've just acquired from HealthWise that are net new. Like they have a lot of great 3D animations that were uh, larger than what we had in the Creams library, which are awesome. Those are easy kind of wins. Um, but there's some overlapping content here too that we're now in the process of figuring out. What's the best content structure? What's the, the right ontology or taxonomy systems to apply to the content like this? So there's a lot. Um, and in a good way, we have very, very deep knowledge when we're thinking of just broadly speaking around AI and what can be done there, we're starting from such a large content set to do things with, um, but it is a lot. Um, multimedia content, you know, we're not just talking written content, but medical illustrations, um, videos, lifestyles, um, different languages, all those things. So wanted to use this graphic because I think a lot of folks in the room can resonate with something like this in their life in an agency where there is a, a room, there's a vision of what we want to do. You know, I could come up here and sit and pitch like, hey, look at all this great content we have and it's amazing and we're the only one that can do it or things like that. And there are stories like that, but outside of the door, right, we're just two months into this acquisition of HealthWise, right? And that's we don't have all that figured out. We don't have how every single piece of content is gonna work or which content structure is the right way to go with, but we're figuring it out, right? And it's complicated, right? It is complicated, and there are a lot of things to, to try to figure out. So some of those complications that we're actively discussing and making decisions on, and, and we are starting the path here uh, down the way, but. We have multiple legacy backend systems. Some are .NET, some are homegrown uh, systems, some are proprietary contracts we're trying to unwind. Um, we have legacy teams that are very ingrained in like this is how I write content and moderate it and get it to review um, that we're having to uh, reconcile into one process. Uh, we have different content models and taxonomies across different pieces of content that we're having to bring together. The good news is there's a lot of great data there, but you do have to figure out, I always use the silly example, but are we spelling orthopedics with an AE or an E, right? Like let's have an approach of what we wanna go with and understand that it's a synonym and it should work what, regardless of what someone searches for. Um, different front end tools, like name a front end technology and there's likely some place in our org that we have that, that we're trying to align. Um, Ongoing support for existing APIs. So we have clients that are ingesting our content through APIs that were built seven years ago. And as we're looking at changing back end functionality, how do we not break how they're consuming it? How can we support those legacy APIs while also building you know, new future forward specs as well? Um, 
complex content workflow processes. I mentioned that, uh, just how do you govern content and where it's at in a step, not just one language, but multiple languages. How do you do that as well? The medical review. So all of our content goes through a triple uh, blinded medical review. So there's a draft of content, goes to a uh, medical professional to review, comes back with revisions, or revisions are made. We can do that three more t or two more times uh, before that content gets published. Um, yeah, and then custom requests from clients, right? Clients will have their own content needs too. So how do you manage their need to say, hey, you don't have content on this, or I do that procedure differently here? So a lot, a lot of stuff to figure out. And at this point, I think of this slide being like, these are just our problems Drupal aside, right? When in, whatever technology you want to use, these are kind of the problems with a huge, massive content corpus. Some of the advantages and why we're re rebuilding our backend architecture on Drupal to support this um, is, you know, Drupal's open source and there's an awesome community here. Thought it was really fascinating in the Dries note earlier of like, hey, how many people have worked in Drupal? You know, five years, 10 years, 15 years. And um, there is an absolute wealth of knowledge in this space. Um, and that's something I think is a major advantage and something we, we were very interested in. Um, ridiculously flexible content models and data types. So we do have some complex interrelations of content um, HealthWise in particular has some structures of content where I can write just a chunk of what a topic is, like what is a knee replacement as a paragraph, and I can serve it up as a paragraph and as a page of content and as multiple pages of content. Um, being able to source that across different articles so I can make an edit in one place, like the example yesterday I heard was um, updated guidelines for hypertension. We want to be able to update that in one place and have an update on all pages that are using that same uh, definition. Um, supporting third-party DAMS ontology taxonomy systems. This was big for us in Drupal. Either it's not, if it's not built, you do have that ability to build your own API integrations, modules. Um, Drupal's you know, at the core built for multilingual support, being an international tool, great content moderation and workflow steps. Um, kind of choose your own adventure on what search appliances you want to use, like the big old names as well as some of the newer tools available, um, robust user permissions, and strong foundation for AI. So we're using um, a decent amount of open AI and doing kind of an AI search. I'll demo in a minute. But really, we're looking at it more as how do we build ourselves for the future as well, where, you know, OpenAI might be a good solution today, but what Google's working on or other, other uh, big software companies, we want to be able to flex and take advantage of those as well. All right, so the first thing I want to walk through is this is our first uh, Drupal-based product where we're using that content. And um, Health Hub is a new product for us, and it's a replacement for what... Um, health systems in the room might think of as what used to be like a consumer health library. Like a, here's a library of content, the A to Z directory of, you know, things that you can either embed into your site or have a subsite for. Um, there's some advantages of those kinds of tools, uh, but as someone who's built a lot of hospital websites, I always wanted more from those things. Like, hey, can I integrate that into my site? Can I modify that content? Can I change the taxonomy tags so my doctors pull into that article like right on page? Can I have more control over the display of this? Um, so that was kind of our starting point with rebuilding it is how can we modernize the experience but also like make this something where for a small system or a small team we could stand up the whole thing very easily but for a more sophisticated team or an agency that wants to take advantage of a full content license and library you can natively integrate this into whatever content types you want and whatever structure you want on your side and receive updates via API for that. Um, so under the hood, just quickly, this is our stack that we've built um, Health Hub on. Um, this is kind of our foundational thinking of when we do Drupal things is, you know, we're, we treat it as a product. We're always going to update it on a monthly basis to the latest versions of Drupal. Um, 
custom tons. Uh, we have over 200 custom modules and APIs that we've built that do different things on our side. And then the interface is branded as well. We mostly use Google Cloud and Pantheon. We do have some Drupal sites that are self-hosted or on Azure um, internally, but um, this is typically for Health Hub, what the structure looks like. And then we have options for HIPAA compliant analytics and tracking. Um, one that might be a little different up here is Gainsight PX. Um, that's like a product uh, walkthrough kind of software where when we push out feature updates, we can notify users like on the next login, tell them about the new features and give them helpful guidance um, into the site. And for our clients, we do have a lot of integrations to uh, you know, pass data into their EMR, CRM systems, or other marketing automation tools. So uh, Health Hub, I'm gonna do a demo uh, of this particular tool and some of the things we're doing here. Um, but to do this, I kinda wanna start with the old tool. So this is the Crames Consumer Health Library, right? And there's roughly about 120 uh, clients that use this tool today. Um, the good news is there is a wealth of content on this site. There's, uh, I think, 31,000 different articles, videos, quizzes, decision aid tools that can help a user navigate the site. But from a user experience, mm, it's not great, right? There's some things that just, you know, the world's updated. We've all gotten a lot better at doing UX. Um, just a few of the things that were really annoying to me was you know, the, the mega nav, um, you know, good luck trying to find something. Like, you just brain can't consume that many links at once. Um, really good luck on a phone trying to navigate something like that. Um, there were a lot of places where a user might have to make multiple clicks to actually get to content. So, okay, now I'm in a table of contents for allergy, and I'll click overview, and now I'm at content. Or if I go back, maybe I click all about asthma, and I get another link tree, and another click. And so it's just, you know, we can do better, right? That, this, is, this is not the best way to deliver it. Um, from a structure perspective, there was also this uh, very hideous URL pattern of not just that it's ending in a number, but the way that this current site works, if I can see my screen, is if I deleted the path and still have that ID, the article's still going to render and the breadcrumbs change, but basically if you try to do a site crawl, it's like an infinite site crawl because any page can show up anywhere. And it was just a real nightmare of figuring out like, hey, these pages really need like a permanent home. And then let's use better use of taxonomies and structures to group content in different ways. Um, so there were just some, some very easy improvements there. Um, another thing is uh, same actions are typically on every page, right? Find a doctor, find a location, pay my bill but it's not really helping someone who's pregnant with asthma find a doctor who can help them with that health topic. It's not, it's just taking the user to like start at the beginning of the find a doctor. Um, so these are some things right away we just were like, okay, we can do better on all these things. We can do this in a way and give the clients a lot more control. And so this is what we are just now rolling out to the market as, as Health Hub. Um, so, few things right away, much more modern experience. Um, everything's kind of built to work great on a phone or different devices. Um, the way we've built this is we have a component library that is brandless, is the way we think about it. It has all the components you would expect in a hospital site, provider cards, location cards, event cards, accordions, you know, all, all different kinds of the Lego blocks you would think. And then we treat hospital brands as their own data structure. So when we're working with a client, we can build out a JSON object of their logos, their colors, their patterns, and just overlay it on the site. And that allows us to take something like this, create it very quickly for a client, brand it, and then all the content is set to update from our own APIs. Um, we're moving to a very search focused experience. So rather than that big link tree, we think we can do a lot better with search. So uh, all of this content in our model 
we're pushing into OpenAI and creating an embedding model. So this creates, uh, I think it's 1,040 some relational pieces of um, what is this content about and how do we understand that content in an embedding. And then we push that embedding into a search appliance called Pinecomb, um, which is a vector search appliance. And that happens um, on the entire library. And then anytime you edit or create a new node, it immediately pushes out to that Pinecone database within five minutes, it's updated. Uh, and this allows us to do some different kind of search things. Uh, some of it's kind of standard search stuff. So like if I search, I can get suggestive terms back. Nothing crazy there. This is just using node names and taxonomy terms associated with the article. But now I can do things that are a little bit more advanced. Um, I can do things where like the keyword or the actual procedure I'm looking for isn't actually in my query. So something like, what surgery do I need if I don't want to have children? Right. And in this example, right, I can search that, I can get results back in a faceted fashion, and you can see it's returning results that are you know, both for men and, and women based on that query. If I add something to it like for men, it can adjust again and understand the context that I'm giving it. And I didn't have to define that, right? Like we are tapping into AI to do it. So for us, this is just like, wow, because we're starting from such a large content set, we can answer a lot of questions like this. And so this is, we've done testing with a few different AI models. Um, there are some like open source clinical um, LLMs that you can use. So we've tested, you know, Elastic, Solar, some different LLMs against that, as well as Pinecone. And for this kind of search, like OpenAI embeddings and Pinecone was a real winner for us. So if that's helpful to anyone in the room, happy to discuss that more. Um, a big thing for us was also being able to do faceted search. So both when you get results back, can I now filter it by like which ones have a video or which ones, um, you know, or a quiz or things like that. But we also wanted to be able to do searching within a major health topic. So we had a view that big libraries are great, but um, most users have one health issue that they're interested in right now. So if I'm reading about heart health, probably don't care too much about you know, your pediatrics content at the moment, right? Maybe tomorrow, maybe another day but these experiences should feel a little bit more immersive. So something like this um, is kind of the new landing page for Heart Health. A client can change anything on this page in a visual editing fashion. We'll flip and show that view in a second. Um, they can add their own calls to action in line. Um, there's different featured articles you can call out, um, uh, but they're, they're all kind of built into this section. Um, just sticking on search for a minute, if I click view all heart health articles, I can get into kind of a faceted search experience as well, where now I can show, okay, now I'm just searching in the heart health library of content. And if I type in something like, you know, failure, right? It's not going to return results from across the whole content set. It's gonna return results from like what's in this particular section. And if I happen to search something that is not in this section, if I search just like pediatrics, it'll give you a, a good message saying, hey, there's no results in this section. Would you like to search the whole site against that same term? Um, so we felt like this was important as well of like sometimes people know like my issues related to diabetes, but I might not want to search and get results on the whole library. Or we have a lot of content that's just for adults or just for children, right? And Sometimes the broad search can show results for both, and that's not necessarily what we, what we want to return there. Um, so I think this is a good time to kind of flip to the logged in version. And I'll go to that same page just to show. So this would be like what a client has access to uh, if they were using Health Hub as the full front end interface. Um, they would be able to um, you know, view content like this. We're using layout paragraphs um, heavily for this. So in this example, everything on the page is visually editable. If I wanted to drag and drop these items around, I can on the page. 
if I wanted to you know, edit this text here, I can just click edit, pull it up and make a change. Or if I wanted to add new sections, I kind of have that ability to do that, you know, add three columns and start building in, you know, whatever I want in a new section. So um, we're trying to give a client the ability to say, look, we're giving you a great starting point with all of these health center collections, but we typically see these as the spots where a, a hospital or health system care provider would want to say, love all this content, but I want to put my patient story in there or I want to put my calls to action uh, into this section. Like it could be an email sign up, it could be something uh, deeper. But a page like the overview pages is very visually editable without a data model from, from a back end perspective. But as you get into an article or something more detailed, I'm just clicking into heart failure here, um, what you'll get is you know, here's that medically reviewed content um, that's coming through. You just scroll to the bottom quickly where you can see here's the medical reviews and last time it was reviewed, um, which in a world of generative content, we're really feeling like that is a strong signal of trust, both to the user as well as to search engines on like where did this content come from and what is the quality of it. Uh, but a uh, common request we've had is clients saying, hey, this great, article, but I need to add something to that, or I need to make an adjustment, like I need to add my own taxonomy terms to it, or I want to change the title slightly, right? There's a, all real requests. Um, we've built a sourcing governance system with our tools and how they work with APIs, and we're exposing that here. So if I click edit, these fields by default get grayed out, they're disabled from being edited. Um, and that's the default position so that the API can update this article whenever we make updates. And it's on either a daily or weekly basis, depending on a client's choice. Um, but we've added this whole sourcing tab where you can multi-source content. And one of the choices is just to change a field to manual. So if I wanted to unlock, let's say, the title and the body on this article and click update, then this node allows me to now edit those fields and they become unlocked from the API. So the other fields like taxonomies in this example would still update from the API, but now I can do whatever I want to in this body field, make whatever changes I want, but it's off from the content we've provided. You are now in control as the user of this tool to you know, hopefully make good edits, but sometimes bad ones. And, you know, actually see those, those changes published to the front end and um, be, be available. So there's my, my Andy. And then the last piece is that in the sourcing tab, I can also do a comparison. So I can do a live API call back to the original content source. And then here's my manual ones. And then I can kind of choose what to do. Now, one new feature we're building here is the ability to uh, report on this to a client. So using timestamps of edits of, hey, client, you made a change to this page on this date, and if we've made an update to our content after that date, can we notify you and have some kind of dashboard reporting to let them know, like, hey, there's seven pages of content you, you might want to consider for a review that we have new content for. Um, so, um, this is a very different thing. Like, uh, I know we use it a lot, but I haven't seen any other Drupal sites that are kind of doing the governance like this. Um, and we feel like this is a huge, um, important tool for, for our clients to, to have access to. Uh, last thing, if I don't forget to do it, I will mess this demo up, but you can flip it back, <laughs> click update, and yes. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So the way we have the tool set up is that if you set change the title or the body to manual, then the medical review chunk of the article disappears. So that, that's our way of saying, if you've made an edit, we are no longer responsible for, for that and we're not gonna present that to the user. 
Uh, it's a great point. I, was th I had the same thought. From a trust standpoint, we just can't allow that. Yeah. So that's how we're handling it. Yes? So I recall in one of your interviews there was this strange ad if you were to make this to school summer project. Yeah. It's the library summer. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm imagining this is maybe a similar, you know, it's, it's more custom. You have your AI power search or prompting it. And is it, is it override more or less to allow that customization to take care of that kind of low end of index or low end of kind of other shared value? It's a great question. So the, it could be, that is a use. If a client wants to make this their own in a certain way, you could do that, right? You're gonna lose the medical review, but you can do that. What we've seen change at scale with this library, even with Cream, current Cream's customers, is that the duplicate content is ranking, right? So what we've seen change is, and Google's actually openly talked about this too, is they can't crawl sites faster then the entire internet crawls sites and gets shared on social media or scraped and put on other sites. They are not good at saying this is the absolute authority owner of content anymore. It gets shared faster than they can crawl the site. And they're pretty open about that. So they, there's not as much of a penalty for duplicate content, uh, but unique content will always be better than, than syndicated content. So the, the question is really like, do you have enough content to power an AI search, right? Like in a world where Google is gonna eat more of that search page, um, you know, how do you become the authority for your market and the services that you provide? At some point with AI search, it comes down to like, how much content do you have? Can you answer the query? Um, so to us, it's kind of like, we can help fill the library, and then with this tool, we're looking at it saying, maybe you want to have that control to make that choice of when you want to do it. Yeah, it's a great question. So, yes? So, the tweet said that the same year of publication was when it started to see the special revenue for Amazon increase. Yeah. Can you have something then that might flag that to say, okay, so why did it increase? Kind of, can it be validated with data? We don't have like the automated like notification to do it. We do have the data point. So like we have interfaces where we can say, um, you know, of the 30,000 articles, 17 of them are set to manual and click here to, you know, see the list of the 17 that have manual edits. But there, we have not built the process to actually like from Drupal notify this person. Yeah, it's good. That's actually a good feature. I like that. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to flip just for a second to the alternate use. I'm going to use this site to do it, but I'm showing more of the site in a box approach, right? Like here's all the content, here's editing harnesses. All the content here also has open APIs out, so you could consume this to your own application with the governance. You could do that but I do wanna show just kind of how we are working um, with APIs on this site visually. So big learning for us in building hospital sites and working with provider and location and event APIs is that when we can make APIs visual where a marketer can browse them and view them and live call data, we solve at least half of the support tickets on, this thing's not right, that data point's wrong, can you look at it? And it, those things don't have to go to engineers more when you can make them visual. So we've been using a similar harness for like provider data and location data, we're now using it for content. Um, so this is just a way to browse the entire library of content. If you are looking to integrate this content library into your site, if your approach was like, I love the content, but I want it in myhospital.com, or if, and if I'm an agency, like, I want to use this content on the new site that I'm building, this is just a way you could work with the API. You would still define how you want to pull the data into your data models, but I would highly suggest having this kind of interface where you can browse and search the content. So here, you can expose some collections. So if I was doing something with like COPD, you know, I can just call and see what's, what's all in that collection. For us, like I could select a few of these. 
this little blue icon means this is already imported, so it's telling me like that content already exists, but I'll pretend that it doesn't. You can choose which fields you want to import, and if you click import, it would go ahead and create those nodes. Um, you can also have this done just automated in the background, pull the whole library through. But we're actually seeing it used like this a good bit. And the use case is um, we work with some health providers. Uh, I'll, I'll mention one by name, Village MD, where they don't do comprehensive health care. They do primary care sp for a specific audience. So they want parts of the library, but they're in a boat that's kind of like, hey, I'm not certain what content I want to use yet, right? I can pull through some now, but in a month or two, I might want to pull some of that other content too. So their use of it in an in, in API approach allows them to kind of decide how they want to use this in a different way. Any other questions on Health Hub? Jesse. So we wouldn't provide that for you as like a, a search tool to your site. Like that's just not our core business in doing that. But you could use this content. In that use case, I would suggest pulling it into your site. Or we would have to build like a joint uh, vector database where you're calling it from here, you're loading in your Drupal content to that same search appliance and doing it from there. But I just, I'll say, from a order of magnitude effort, our MVP with uh, OpenAI and Pinecone took three days. So it took three days for us to stand up that initial build of that. And that was partially because, I can't remember the developer's name, there's someone in the Drupal community that built out kind of an OpenAI module and then basically a starter for Pinecone. We built our own eventually, but um, that allowed us to start faster. So great example of like open source community made this faster for us to kind of grab and, and make it our own there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what he's referring to is Healthwise has a way to call just a paragraph of content or just a chunk of content um, and pull just that into your site. It still does get into like how you're indexing your site. Like, is it because there's ways to just grab embed code and put it on the site. There's eight ways to call it via API. So eventually it comes down to like how you're calling it and how um, it gets indexed on your site search as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not going away, okay. right? That that's um, we think that that's a cool feature, and I think it's something that we want to support. But we also want to be able to provide like larger collections. Um, the Crames library is about double the size of the Healthwise library, so there's a lot more content. But the Healthwise side kind of has these like chunks, like give me the small paragraph on knee replacement, the you know three paragraphs on it, which we think is really cool. Like I, I think that's a, a great way to structure content and feed it to AI and other things as well. All right, we got a couple minutes. Okay, I'm gonna do the fastest demo ever of the, the other tool. Um, okay, so this is another brand new tool built on Drupal. 
um, but really built as a service, right? Um, this is called Health Advisor. Um, these are health risk assessments. So um, just, does anyone in the room use health risk assessments today on their websites, like licensed? Yes, uh, yeah. Yeah. Not using that as okay. So like typically a health risk assessment is it's this marketing vehicle uh, that is perfect for a person in a healthcare journey that is not ready for care yet, right? So how do you give them a tool beyond just written content to assess their risk for heart disease or assess their risk for uh, getting breast cancer or scoring how bad is their knee pain. And for a health system, you can also control the options that you show to that user. So for those folks that are in a healthcare journey, there's 20X the volume of I want to know type of health search online versus I wanna go. These are those great tools that there's an even exchange of information for I can take this quiz, I can get a score and a little more information, but in exchange, the health system might capture some information, my email, so that they can send me other relevant content. Uh, go through this super fast, but all of this is built on Drupal. It does not look like Drupal, that is by design. It is all using like a Vue.js front end, um, and all of these points can be called via API. But um, I'll just click into like the heart health assessment here. Um, these all have um, embeddable objects, so you could embed this on your site. Um, it can be completed. I'm not gonna go through all the steps here, um, but basically at the end of the assessment, um, you can control what the answers are. And I'm gonna jump here to the, the editing screen. But typically, what health systems would want to do with things like this is based on the user's risk assessment score, be able to show different options to the user. So if I have high risk, maybe I drive them towards finding a cardiologist or location. Um, if I um, am low risk, maybe it's an email sign up, that kind of thing. Where we're going with this is, so these are all now editable by the client. Um, you can go in here and make edits to this kind of thing. Um, but these are also capable of handling JavaScript and other kinds of content here too. So where we see this going is, you know, Jesse, you being able to put, you know, your scheduling options here right on the page with next available cardiologists, right? Or if it's breast cancer, maybe it's mammogram locations nearest you, right? That you can put it in line with the action. Um, so very quick demo here, yeah. Yeah, so it, we're, we, it's using web form with hundreds of hours <laughs> of built into functionality to handling the scores and the interfaces. We also do like sub-assessment scores. So like, you know, your risk for heart disease is high, but because you're a smoker, that made you have an elevated risk. Because you are overweight, that had an elevated risk. And those descriptions all have medically reviewed answers but you can customize those as well. So if you wanna add a link to your smoking cessation class in line, you can do that as well. So um, lots of customizations here, but these are very productized uh, options. It's not something we'd give a client, like here's the access to the full backend, because they are very medically significant um, and heavily scrutinized assessments by uh, health system clients, as well as our own medical team. Um, but they're awesome tools. So when we implement this, we typically can triple conversion rates on campaigns that are just using, you know, the classic schedule an appointment, call kind of options. There's just a ton of users in health journeys for, you know, cardiology, orthopedics, cancers, where they're not ready for an appointment yet, but they might be aware of an issue. And this is just a great way to stay engaged, get an email, start identifying a person, and uh, deliver content to them. So covered a, a lot, but uh, any any questions? All right, thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Andy. I can see where that'd be so helpful to be integrated in with the healthcare sites versus you know going off to Crames and a separate site and it's all kind of a separate experience. So I'm going to turn it over to Pooja to uh, kick off our, our sponsor speaker. So whoever is, we'll get you up here and get you all hooked up and ready to go. Hello. Okay. So all right, let's kick things off with our incredible lineup of speakers from Phase Two. First up, we have amazing Trisha Bell, our growth director, who will be sharing her wisdom on adapting to change, navigating privacy and compliance in healthcare analytics. Next, we have the creative genius himself, Matt Curtin, our director of design, presenting creative observations while crafting healthcare digital experiences. Last, but certainly not least, we have Caitlin Loss, our VP of Brand Marketing, taking the stage with why digital sustainability matters to healthcare. Let's give a huge round of applause off to our fantastic sponsors. <laughs> Trisha, the stage is yours. Found the browser, everybody. <laughs> Progress. <laughs> we did it. Okay. Come over here. Oh my goodness. Did that work? It's that on worked? the screen. That's what's all the screen. It's on the screen now. Okay, so we're good. Yeah. All right. Good morning. I'm Trisha Bell, as she said. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be kicking off the lightning talk for Phase 2. Phase 2 is a digital experience partner, and we specialize in healthcare. So what I'm excited to be talking to you guys about today is patient privacy. And it matters to all of us because when we go to a healthcare systems website, what we're viewing might be personal, and it might be sensitive. We don't want targeted ads based on what we're viewing. More than anything, we need trust with the healthcare system and with our doctors. And, more, and a lack of privacy is a violation of that trust. This has been a passion topic of mine for the last 18 months. And I think arguably in healthcare, there's nothing more important. So let's rewind the clock together and let's go back to December of 2022. And if you all remember, this was on the OCR, the Office for Civil Rights, issued clarifications regarding HIPAA requirements for healthcare. It was a pretty wild time. And there were articles about healthcare systems negatively for pixel tracking and lawsuits were popping up everywhere. So before I go more into that, let me ask you all a question. During the eight month period of August of 2022 through April of 2023, just those eight months, how many lawsuits against healthcare systems for pixel tracking were there? <laughs> 
Yeah, there were a lot. There were over 50 in just those eight months, and we know that they've only continued to date. If you all remember, one of the biggest blows to digital marketing teams was the realization that they needed to sign to have a HIPAA compliant agreement with their analytic tool called a business associate agreement. And the biggest tool in use, Google, wouldn't sign that agreement. So for our, a lot of our clients, they simply turned off all analytics. They operated their digital marketing in the dark. They were afraid to use the tools that they knew and found so valuable for fear of being sued. So we immediately began consulting with our clients, clients like Tufts Medicine, Gunderson Health System, Community Health Network, and more. There was a lot of ambiguity in what the OCR had shared. And so there were a lot of mixed reactions, depending if we were talking to marketing, to IT, or to legal. Some wanted to strip Google away from their entire operations, where some really, really wanted to find a compliant way to keep it. Uh, what did remain universal, though, is they knew they valued tracking web and ad analytics to justify the ROI and justify digital marketing spend and receive that valuable data. So the work we were doing with our clients was risk assessments, digital strategy, reviewing tools if they wanted alternate uh, solutions and implementing, implementing those tools were applicable. So now let's fast forward. And just a couple of months ago in March, the OCR clarified the clarifications and they shared a little bit more insight. Two that we found most interesting were number one, that the IP address alone was no longer considered to be a personal identifier. So that was great news. Number two, health systems can in fact track and collect PHI if they use a tool like a customer data platform that will de-identify and disclose only what's compliant to a web analytic tool like a Google that won't sign the BAA. So this was great news for companies that wanted to keep Google. It also put the official seal of approval on phase two's interpretation of the spirit of the requirements and what was part of our consulting. So the work we are doing now, the work we're doing now with these latest uh, requirements and clarifications is consulting with our clients as to what do these mean to them. Uh, also the tools and market have really evolved. So we're sharing those insights and consulting with our clients in that. We're also supporting on training of new tools, uh, establishing governance around new tools, and uh, supporting them with rebuilding dashboards. If the collection tools have changed, likely the reporting needs to evolve as well to truly be valuable. Uh, what, throughout all of these changes, what I will say is one thing that has stayed the same is really the importance of this topic. Patients deserve to know that their health systems are keeping their privacy. All right, thank you, Tricia. So I wanted to talk to you all today about some creative observations uh, while crafting digital experiences in healthcare. Uh, I've broken this down into five different topics. Uh, the first, number one, is solidifying the overall brand. Uh, oftentimes, uh, one of the main objectives with a website build is that the digital product becomes the largest brand touch point for a healthcare system. Uh, in order to successfully do this or achieve this, um, the overall brand must be strong and well-established. Everyone at the organization should be aligned on the brand platform, positioning, and voice and tone before beginning the project. As UI designers, like myself, uh, we can bring consistency and augmentation to a brand, but this process should not be the primary driver for a brand redesign. A solid brand guidelines and writing style guide is, is, key is a key foundation for success. Number two, this transitions nicely into this, brand balancing brand expression with utility. Uh, the patient and visitor is at the heart of our digital strategy. The website needs to cater to the audience needs and tasks, like finding providers and locations, learning more about treatments and conditions, and just generally living better and healthier lives. After years of industry experience, we know what elements need, are needed for success and the components that help with usability. Through design, our goal is to prioritize usability and best practice conventions, while also finding opportunities for brand expression, highlighting differentiators and elements that make your organization unique. 
how can we mix brand impact and what we refer to as elements of delight while ensuring that the digital experience improves and simplifies the visitor's lives? Number three, establishing holistic human experience. Large healthcare websites usually involve several integrations with third-party systems. The Drupal CMS is a fantastic platform for handling these complex integrations. As designers and developers, we tend to get caught up in the technical aspects of a project, focusing our attention on how something's built, the overall code base, the design system with web components. We need to always remember to take a step back and consider what is really important, the individual looking for care. We need to design with our audience in mind, no matter what or how complex the technology that's involved. I'll wrap up this point with a quote pulled from Steve Jobs, focusing on product outcomes over outputs. You've got to start with the customer experience and work backwards from the technology. You cannot start with technology. Number four, aligning with stakeholders. Every group in the healthcare organization has goals and priorities they want to achieve with this rebuild. From patient care, research, education, giving, events, careers, and marketing, there's a lot of voices in the mix. A strong information architecture and content strategy is vital to the overall design. The experience needs to be clean and straightforward while also making it easy to navigate to the desired sections of a vast network. For collecting stakeholder feedback, we, we've seen a lot of clients forming decision committees. While this can be effective, We've recently had success uh, nominating what we call a feedback ambassador. The ambassador ensures that all design feedback is consolidated, collectively agreed upon, and aligns with the core project goals and vision. Number five, moving to the browser faster. The final observation I'll leave you with is that all the, one, one of the biggest pain points of any healthcare site build, moving away from the design files and into the browser. Too many projects, projects get stuck in the design feedback loop without really considering the experience once all the pieces are put together, including finalized messaging and imagery. The end user will be consuming code in the browser, not the designs in Figma. While as designers, we love iterating and prototyping in Figma all day long, it's imperative that we start working with real web components and content as soon as possible. Drupal is such a powerful platform for building dynamic web experiences with tools like Layout Builder. With the power comes the potential disconnects between what was designed and what is built and configured. By getting to the browser quickly, feedback can be collected from editors faster and more efficiently in order to close those gaps. I've just covered some topics really quickly of all aspects of the creative process. Having strong brand foundations at the very beginning, finding opportunities for brand expression with the focus on usability and function ensuring that all stakeholders' voices are heard, but making sure we stick to the unified vision and goals, identifying the right time to move out of the design iteration and into the browser. However, the most important topic of all is focusing on establishing the holistic human experience. Our vision here at phase two is digital experience that advances the human experience. Throughout this project, uh, product journey, no matter what challenges we face, we need to remember the end user. What they need matters most. Awesome. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, I'm wrapping up our little mini lightning talk session here talking about digital sustainability. Earlier this week, Matt and I spoke about digital sustainability in a larger session, but I was excited to come and talk to you all about some of the specifics around healthcare uh, and impacts. So everything that humans need for their survival and well-being depends either directly or indirectly on the natural environment. This is a quote from the American Hospital Association Sustainability Roadmap. And I wanted to start with this because this is really what it's all about. The environment is an enormous factor in the health of human beings, and for that reason, we have to be its stewards. Those of us in the healthcare industry are acutely aware of the importance of environmental sustainability for human health and well being. Um, and here are a few interesting stats around that. Climate related causes cost the health healthcare industry $820 billion every year. In addition, they're also, uh, they also are responsible for 75% of hospital evacuations. Um, and the healthcare industry is responsible for nearly 10% of all US greenhouse gas emissions. So it's really clear that the health sector has an enormous influence on and is impacted by sustainability. 
And since we're here at DrupalCon, of course, today we're talking digital sustainability. So if you're not familiar with digital sustainability, it's the concept that the energy output from the digital products that we create is highly variable based on how we build and how we power them. Digital sustainability is the practice of designing and implementing digital design systems and technologies in a way that supports the long-term ecological balance and reduces environmental impact. Simply put, we can build a more sustainable internet. And this really matters to healthcare organizations for several reasons, regulatory requirements, um, environmental impact, ESG visible wins from marketing perspective, and the impact on health equity and access. So first, when it comes to regulation, we can really look to Europe and California as trailblazers in what's coming on a broader US scale around regulation. And without getting too technical, reporting requirements in those areas are incredibly detailed, including all indirect upstream and downstream climate impacts of all business operations. It's super, super detailed. And this is where digital factors are a huge consideration. The energy output of digital products themselves, hosting and data storage energy costs, and the energy required of all third-party integrations. Tracking digital emissions and showing progress towards reducing them will be a significant piece of the puzzle when it comes to delivering on ESG priorities. And beyond regulatory requirements, many health organizations have signed significant climate pledges, most notably the Health and Human Services Health Sector Climate Pledge. I know a few of you in this room have signed this pledge. Phase two recently signed it as well. Um, it's a big commitment, reducing emissions by 50% by 2030 and achieving net zero by 2050, in addition to opting into these very, very stringent reporting requirements. Um, I also wanna call out our partner, Acquia, who's made a similar commitment, uh, both from an organizational and business perspective. So the sustainable uh, web design of your site, green hosting and tooling selection, as well as general systems consolidation are all important ways to lower your carbon footprint, improve the performance of your digital products, and reduce energy costs. And from a marketing perspective, beyond your annual sustainability report, it's hard to find visible ways to really differentiate your brand's commitment to sustainability. Having a sustainable site is an incredible way to do that. Um, completing a thorough baseline assessment, setting page weight goals, tracking progress, and sharing digital sustainability expertise on your site are great ways of demonstrating your sustainability commitment and progress. And this area is still new enough in the US that it can really be a differentiator, the digital sustainability side. And it's a great way to also bring in your marketing, IT, and digital teams to sustainability efforts that may have otherwise not been in their purview. And I wanna shout out Advent Health here, of course, who's made some amazing uh, sustainability. <laughs> uh, they've made sustainability a huge priority, very visible, and it's an incredible differentiator. And more than anything, a sustainable site is a lightweight and performance site which means easier access for people who may not have their own devices or access to fast Wi-Fi. And when it comes to health, the more barriers that we can break down for equity and access, the better, of course. So that is the briefest possible overview of digital sustainability. Um, Matt and Trisha and I are here to talk to you about uh, any follow-up conversations, and thanks so much. loud enough yeah <laughs> thank you so much to you so now it's time for a well-deserved break stretch your legs grab a refreshment let all that knowledge sink in and we'll see you all in 15 minutes 15, yeah. 10 30. yes 10 30 sharp thank you
there's, yeah, there's this guy. Yeah. Uh, or there's this guy. Okay, let me this try. It. Let me yeah. try it real quick just to make sure yeah. I can. I can uh, Hello. See my
Hello. No. This is too tall. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Okay, welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the short break. Now it's time to dive into our table talk session. For the next 30 minutes, we'll be discussing exciting topics on AI in the healthcare. First up, let's talk uh, on our topic, the future of AI in healthcare. So what areas of healthcare do you think AI can make the biggest impact in the future? This is gonna be the topic for the next 15 minutes and I would request anyone who's sitting by themselves to like come forward and to be a part of the table conversations. Yes. Don't be shy. Yeah. And yeah, by the end of this talk session, we could have like one person representing each of the tables, having like a brief summary of what y'all talked about. <laughs> oh, so the question, I can repeat the question. The question was, what areas of healthcare do you think AI can make biggest impact in the future?
Okay, so we're in the end of the 15 minutes. I would like for two volunteers from two tables to have give me like a brief summary of what you have been talking about. Can I have two brave volunteers to like tell me what you're all talking about from like any of the tables? Yeah, let's go. Yes, yes, please, please. Oh. I can wing it. So uh, our table discussed a lot on the on the first part of uh, how AI would affect healthcare, just in the patient journey, right? Uh, when you go about looking for uh, treatments and conditions, um, a lot of what Andy showed in the Health Hub, right? Trying to get that educational component. From there, um, I think we talked about even more impact in terms of how patients get treated, right? So there are some major um, healthcare organizations that are using AI-powered programs to get better outcomes, right? Whether it's cardio, orthopedic. Um, so th it's that extra, I don't know if you wanna call it guardrails or extra knowledge repository that the AI is using for, to empower physicians for better outcomes. Wow. Okay, that, that was fantastic. <laughs> Do we have another person who could like summarize what you were talking about? Okay. Okay, so in that case, we'd move. Oh, do we have someone? Wow, thank you. I'm sorry you were just shifting seats, but we're like, you have to give me that. <laughs> yeah, okay. So for our final topic, if you all want to just continue this topic, you're free to do, do so, but I'm just going to like introduce a second topic if you all want to just... Let's talk about AI guidance at our work. What part of your work requires the most AI guidance or assistance, or do you think it would be required in the future? You could talk about that as well. And if you think this does not like, okay, I don't wanna like talk about this topic, you could talk about what AI tools that you're currently using, if at all you're like using any tools.
Okay, we are at the end of this second 15 minute conversation. So if you all want, again, we could have like one person summarizing what you were speaking about. Do we have any volunteers this time? Oh. Yes. I am really interested in this table because like you were all the most active. Like I could hear you guys. <laughs> Okay, fine. And then the, the, the danger of, of the building is that it's not going to be the danger. The danger of uh, losing control of your skin. I mean, getting your skin to control who you're around, where uh, or if you keep the beauty in the dark. Like, if you keep the beauty in the dark. That is interesting. Like, if you're, um, you turn the beauty into the, the pest sensor, mm -hmm. like, the pests will stay ever vigilant. Wow, interesting insights. I'm so glad you guys actually spoke up. <laughs> yeah, so this was an incredible talk session. <laughs> I saw Andy going like this. Yeah, I, I saw him do that. <laughs> Wow, thank you, Andy. <laughs> so, this, oh yeah, let's go.
Thank you so much. Yeah, do you have a last point? <laughs> no, you're totally fine. Thank you so much, though, for sharing so much. So what an incredible talk session this has been. Thank you all for your active participation and the brilliant ideas that were shared. It's clear that we have wealth and knowledge in this room. So I'm in wealth of knowledge and passion in this room. I have had too much coffee at this point, let Jane. So <laughs> thank you so much. I'm going to leave this up to Jane, and she'll take it over. Yeah, come on up. But uh, you can come up here because then we can get you going. Um, okay. So first of all, I wanted to see who, uh, show of hands, who works for an agency. No. All right. And then how many are you on the then on the healthcare side? Okay. Great. Yeah, I know you are. <laughs> um, okay. So we've heard a lot from the agency side, and so now we're going to get to hear from two healthcare veterans representing the healthcare systems. Um, and Jesse stepped out, but Jesse Meese from Advent Health and Georgiana Mosgross from UCLA Health. Um, both Advent Health and UCLA Health um, moved from old platforms to Drupal. Uh, I believe Advent Health was about five years ago and UCLA Health was about three years ago. Um, they consolidate many sites into one and Drupal has allowed them to maintain and grow their site over years. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about how they drive traffic to their site and how they utilize Drupal. Jesse, why don't you come on up here too? Yeah. yeah. And we're going to start with Georgiana, and then we'll have Jesse, and then we'll open it up for some questions. All right. 
That's good. So thank you so much, Jeannie, first for the invitation and right now for the intro. Um, it's my first time at DrupalCon, so it's been an interesting experience, you know, sitting through some of the sessions over the last two days, three days, in fact. Um, I even went to Dries Notes on um, Tuesday or Monday. Who's counting? Yes. And I think one of my main takeaways from his um, presentation was the fact that you need to talk about these successes on the, you know, like any types of successes or, or experiences that are built into the Drupal platform and you need to talk about it outside of your core environment and your core audience so that other folks can learn about it and can consider it in their decision making process. So you can tell from my introduction that I'm not, you know, like the technical whiz, but I have uh, been in charge of the decision making process for the redesign and replatform of uclahealth.org. We began that process, I believe, um, con uh, conceptually in 2020, but really development build started in 2021. Um, so just a little bit about who we are. So UCLA Health is the health system arm of UCLA, uh, number one public university in the States, arguably it changes every year. Um, we um, are comprised of about um, 300 clinics in the greater LA area. We own and operate five hospitals, uh, also located um, in the heart of LA, and we market the practice of 3,500 physicians. And one important point on this slide is that actually um, the enterprise uclahealth.org site plays a big part of our marketing mix because 90% of patient self-scheduling, patient scheduling and forms are being submitted organically through our site. So definitely a big focus as part of our digital experience. Um, what we achieved really quickly, I like to start with the numbers, but uh, we did um, launch our site our MVP about two and a half years ago, it included core experiences that you see across other health system sites, like a find a doctor directory, except we built in a taxonomy rich um, module, if you will, to like help surface those providers in a way that made sense for patients looking for care. We also launched a locations directory that we didn't have in the past. We had these like static pages that were like almost like regional sites where you could see information about the clinics and where they were located within that region, but it wasn't really searchable. Um, our uh, MVP also included a news directory. We have about 9,000 um, news articles today ranging from research announcements, um, talk, you know, patient stories as well as your general blog posts about you know the latest drug like Ozempic and semaglutide. Um, and um, last but not least, we introduced the concept of medical service directory. So we used to have all of our clinical content spread out across, I would say, about 250 sites. Each department, each program, each div division had their own standalone site, their own standalone code base that wasn't essentially integrated into the main uclahealth.org site. Um, and um, we didn't have a branding problem, I wouldn't say that. All of these sites were hosted by us in marketing, but they were still separate sites with separate um, you know, information packaged separately. So um, that was definitely an, an architecture problem that we had to contend with going into this exercise. And last but not least, we do have a robust clinical trials directory pulling data from clinicaltrials.gov, Encore, and other databases, and, and you know, surfacing that on our trials pages that are interrelated through the same taxonomy that we're gonna get to talk about in a little bit um, to like easily uh, help patients navigate from one content type to another. Um, some of the results that we've seen post-launch on the Drupal platform, 50% increase in uh, brand visibility in top one to three Google search results, um, a spike in new local visitors, overall visitors to the site, a time, page, uh, time spent per page, visit duration, page load speed, everything went up. You know, it was unlike, you know, what you would see from a true migration where your numbers actually go down. Um, ours just kind of, we saw that increasing trend from, from day one. Um, the challenge that we were contending with, so I kind of hinted a little bit about a fragmented s local search experience. So um, I'll give you an example of what was happening. You know, when you came to our uclahealth.org site and you typed a, um, a keyword such as neurosurgery, you might see in search results, you know, profiles of doctors that were neurosurgeons because their specialty label was neurosurgery and their profiles were, the find the doctor directory was hosted on the main site. Um, you might also get something like a news story talking about something in you know, neurosurgery, but if you were really looking for the clinical content, those, those conditions, those, tr those treatments, you're trying to get to the meat of the problem, all of that content was living off 
that core site. So it was on the Department of Neuro Neurosurgery side and more so under a division under neurosurgery. So that fragmentation basically was an exact representation of our internal makeup of our health system. So you really had to understand the health system to find the quality, you know, the, the right type of care. So we were hearing that from my patients. You know, we did like two rounds, I believe, of discovery sessions as part of two separate projects that I was involved on, in. And what we were hearing was like, once you're in the system, you're good. You know, your doctor can help you navigate, but like coming in from the outside and trying to understand how to get in and what's the right path was quite convoluted and it was frustrating to patients. Patients were, you know, losing a lot of time and, you know, sometimes, you know, months that they didn't have to lose in the context. So this complicated web setup, this navigation was like, you know, reflected, you know, in their search experience on our site. You know, we were still driving good traffic to these disparate sites. It's just they weren't connected enough so that you could actually maintain that experience in one place. And of course, we, um, we had some um, low-level integrations on the um, legacy platform. Um, and, you know, with bringing our sites into Drupal, into one enterprise site, uh, we were able to like um, you know scale that at a whole nother level. Um, so this is just you know a, a few numbers in terms of how many sites we had to bring in. This was actually a phase two in our transition to Drupal. We went in first with the core experience, the search, the directories, and then we brought in all of those department sites and divisions and the programs and everything that was living off platform um, <laughs> in their own code bases. But to be able to do that. We actually had to look at our own team and our own tools and our processes to help support that because people were, you know, used to like functioning in a certain way, owning their content. I cannot tell you how many discussions I had with our chairs about like, you know, A versus B and why this makes more sense versus like, you know, having their old site that they used to have since 2000, you know, hosted in a separate way and where they can actually log in and make changes. So it was a it was an interesting learning process for our entire team. Um, but you know, we needed basically a patient-centric platform uh, that had an easy navigation. Um, we had to do it in a customized way, and Drupal was picked for that reason because of um, you know the ability to actually extend some of the core modules and contributor modules to and customize those to help serve the experience that we were trying to build on our site. Um, it came with um, insurances in terms of the privacy aspects. Um, and it's definitely able to support migrating, you know, lots and lots of sites into one, right? So whether you take a site section approach or groups or whatever you decide, whatever um, pathway you decide. I'm not going to go into <laughs> too much detail there, but you do have our solution architect in the room, Rick Hawkins, who can, like, <laughs> definitely explain uh, more into, like, the decision making there. But I'm getting to, you know... Part of like what I wanted to talk about today. So our approach, you know, like I said in the beginning, you know, we we weren't dealing with a branding problem. So on the front end, like you would think, like, oh, there's no problem here. All the sites look the same. You know, what 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 are you trying to solve for? So we realized our data model had significant gaps in it. So what we were setting to do from the get go was to actually build in a taxonomy that would help support all the different content types and, and connect users from one type of content to another. So at the time, we were working with a partner that was providing um, a clinical taxonomy of about 30,000, they're now up to 35,000 uh, clinical keywords as part of their, uh, their database, right? So we took our providers and we put them in that provider directory tool and where you were able to actually tag these providers based on their specialty and more granularly based on the concepts that are attached to their specialty. And these are, we're talking here about layman's terms, right? Like keywords that patients might actually look for. It wasn't like a clinical list that a doctor would give me to say I do all of these things and like nobody knew what HIFU means at the time. So we worked with this partner to actually tag all of our 35,000 doc 3,500 doctors and um, doing that, we pulled that es essentially that list of clinical keywords into our Drupal site, but we didn't stop there. We could have just said, okay, this is going to just power the provider directory and leave it at that. And doctors were able to ac actually go in and say, okay, I want to promote myself to show up higher in search for these five keywords versus, you know, the rest of the 500 that I have uh, baked in on my profile. 
what we did is we made that same clinical taxonomy accessible across the site to be able to tag your different types of content. So whether you were putting in an article on the site or you were putting in a location or an event, you have the ability to like use these concepts to tag across. And you know, that minimizes, you know, from an editorial standpoint, you know, you could also use that same taxonomy that's now part of our site to add a link to let's say neurosurgery um, you can configure that link to always po point to your neurosurgery medical service landing page. So wherever you're on the site where that taxonomy term is being displayed, it will always link you to that like landing main page for neurosurgery. So what that means is like less user error, less editing hours, you do it in one, you know, like one take and you have to change it after, uh, after the fact that, you know, it's changed in one place. I think somebody else mentioned that in their presentation prior. So we have a lot of examples of automated updates on our site. We have, you know, te a team block that basically um, adapts auto <laughs> um, automatically when a doctor leaves UCLA Health, their profile gets archived, the team block gets updated so that that doctor no longer appears on that page. I mean, we're saving hundreds of hours just uh, through that team block alone in terms of editing hours. Um, going deeper into like an example of how our taxonomy works today on the site, um, we're basically, this is an example of that neurosurgery site that I mentioned, you know, of course you're gonna have the same elements like, you know, your find your care, find a provider, request an appointment, all of this is personalized to neurosurgery, so it's not taking you to a general appointment form, it's taking you to something that's specifically configured for this neurosurgery section, and in fact that block cascades into all the child pages within this neurosurgery medical service section. So anywhere you land on this subsite, if you will, in this case it's a site section, um, you will always get the same um, links displayed and it, they're accessible and editable in one spot. So if I need to change that phone number CTA, I do it once at the note for the whole site section. Um, we also have, of course, the same standardized taxonomy uh, implemented on the actual copy on the page, right? Um, another example here is how we work this taxonomy into our news directory. So this is an example of a story that talks about applying an AI model to improve uh, outcomes of prostate cancer focal therapy. So when the editor puts the story on the back end, it's, it's, you know, it's a manual process, somebody does have to create the note, but they have the ability, aside from tagging the provider who's mentioned, Dr. Leonard Marks in this case, you can actually tag, you know, like the program that the person is a part of, or the program you're trying to market as part of having this story on the site. So you'll see here you have, you know, prostate cancer as a program that's being tagged, and neurology. Um, so what that means is, you know, with that relationship from the back end, and I'm showing a little bit, I mean, this is a standard edit form. We have these on all of our content types. You know, we have about 15 content types, I think, within Drupal today because of the different applications we're using. But you can, you know, then manipulate this data to help surface, for example, related stories about that doctor on his cancer member profile page, like we see here. Or vice versa, if you're on the medical service page for, um, prostate cancer or even one layer deep for high intensity of mm, HIFO, I think, high intensity focal ultrasound, um, you can surface the story because you are able to actually tag that story on the back end as a HIFO related story. So it's all about the ways of, na you know, helping patients navigate in finding, you know, from a complex topic that they may be landing on, um, a new story about to navigate them back to the doctor that actually is, you know, like part of a team of only three doctors offering this therapy on the West Coast, for example. It's very hard to find that information is what we're hearing from our patients. Um, why I decided to show you guys just an example of taxonomy as part of our articles, about 40% of our traffic to UCLAHealth.org lands on one of our articles. So we've, you know, we had um, somebody presented on uh, privacy and the issue with Google Analytics. We were flying blind for about phase two, I think you guys presented on that. We flew, flew blind for about 18 months, so we were, definitely operating on assumptions at that point to say, okay, we think the stories are driving traffic. We eventually got validated on that, but that's really what the, you know, like what um, we um, were, you know, pouring a ton of effort into migrating first our uh, library of news from a third party platform into our site and then using this taxonomy that was present there to tag providers and locations and medical services and tying that back into um, this news uh, directory. Um, and. 
a few more stats to showcase some of the results. So just looking back at the last 12 months, I believe April 2023 to March 2024, we bumped up that percentage of how much um, you know, traffic we're getting from the organic site in terms of open scheduling or form submissions. So 94% were ba basically close to as 100% as we can get. Um, and that's an equivalent of $18 million in the value of organic, you know, coming from organic. So I would have to spend that much on you know, paid campaigns to be able to bring in that same volume and an equivalent of 31 million in total revenue just for those from those online appointments coming in through the site. So if you have any questions, or I can wait until the yeah. end. Well, no, you have to go now yeah. because then we'll, we'll open it up for questions. Sounds good. All right. I know, should I make that joke? I'm the guy holding you guys from lunch, that thing? <laughs> no. Yeah, I'm in my last, last person. So uh, helping consumers find what they're looking for, helping patients get the care that they need, right? That's the commonality between the taxonomy and uh, the schema that I'm gonna talk about uh, with you all today. Quick show of hands. Uh, how many of you are really familiar with schema today? Like you're really comfortable with it. You understand what it is. Awesome, not many hands. That gives me good hope. <laughs> um, of those that raise their hands, how many of you guys are really familiar with um, linked entity recognition? You know what it is, you know how it benefits your sites? Put your hand down, Anna. <laughs> Showing off. I had to go after you in the first place. So. All right, so um, how about knowledge graphs? Any, anyone, don't do it, don't. <laughs> Knowledge graphs, anyone? Chris puts his hand up. Okay, we got a few hands. Excellent, so I'm not gonna waste most of your time today. This is kind of a weird way to introduce myself. Uh, my picture's too big, that's not, I should have rethought that. Um, <laughs> but thank you for joining, uh, introduce myself.